Okay, so we were uh, trying to solve this little riddle. How do we get the first element of the first element of a two-dimensional array? Um, so let's, uh, first of all, let's find the mouse. There we go. So let's redefine uh, lists uh, to be something that we know will succeed. And then later on, we can look at what will happen in the failure case. So the obvious thing to try is to take the head of the list. Uh, so what should this give us? Just the first. Yeah, just the foo bears. Yep, that's right. And so how do we perform operations on a maybe? We can map, yeah. So let's uh, map and let's figure out what we're going to do. So this function here is going to receive essentially one list as an argument and then it's going to do something with that list. So let's say it's going to take the head of that list. <laughs> just, just foo. Now the first thing, because I like to clean things up as I go, this is unnecessary function wrapping. So we can just simplify that to map head over the head of the list. Now we have nesting. We have this maybe inside a maybe. Can anyone remember how we get rid of one level of nesting? We can join. Join takes away one level of nesting from a nested structure. So now we have the answer that we wanted. Uh, we got the first element of the first element of this uh, two-dimensional array. So can anyone remember how we can avoid introducing the unwanted nesting that forced us to use join to undo uh, that nesting? <laughs> so the trick is, Go back to the version uh, that was using map. This is the version that introduced the unwanted nesting. And change map to chain, aka flat map. Uh, and that's, that's it. That's how we do it. And so if we had a list of lists of lists, we could use exactly the same technique. We could use head to get the first, uh, the first element. Then we could chain head chain head and we can chain head and inf add infinitum uh, to to dig as deep as uh, we might need to go so chain is uh, a wonderful function so this is the the first version that we wrote we use pipe uh, we took the head we had to map to get inside the maybe um, but the function that we provided to map returned a maybe so we ended up with nesting and we use join to undo the nesting, then we replace the map and join with chain. And it's a nice property uh, that will always be equivalent, assuming that your data types have been uh, implemented lawfully, uh, they should always be equivalent. So I love refactoring. Um, refactoring with the compiler is nice. Um, refactoring in JavaScript is often based on unit tests and reasoning, uh, but this is certainly something which is um, quite easy to reason about once one has uh, internalized that rule. So yeah, we can take the head, chain, and take the head. Uh, so now what do we have? Well, we now have the ability to take the head of nothing, which is going to give us nothing. Or we could take the head of just empty array, that's going to give us nothing. So what you'll notice here is that we collapsed two different failure cases. So in the first example, we had nothing as our input. And one way to think about that is this expression would probably occur somewhere in a pipeline. And the nothing that's coming in uh, is indicating that some previous computation failed. And so we just pass along that failure value. Uh, the second one is a bit different. The previous computation gave us a just, so it was a successful computation, but our head function failed. It took that empty array and produced nothing, which is the failure value. And of course, the last thing we could try is we could try giving it uh, just a non-empty array, and then we're going to get back just the first element of that array. <coughs> 
parsing a JSON string is another operation which may fail. And I've put JSON in quotes there because there's really no such thing as a JSON string. It's just a string that may or may not uh, be valid when, when interpreted as JSON. Uh, so, you know, typical uh, JavaScript example. Uh, let's parse. Let's parse this, and this is uh, not going to work because we forgot to, um, you know, finish our array. Uh, so we're just going to get a runtime error, um, which is not great. Uh, if this were an API uh, server that we're dealing with, this we'd probably need to put it inside a try block, do something in the case of the exception, or we could just use a function that. Um, means we never need to think about exceptions. So let's look at the type of this. Um, this is pretty interesting. Now there are three different functions in Sanctuary that all, uh, that all have one of these predicates as the, the first argument. So you can see that the first argument to parse JSON is this really general predicate. You won't see this any type used very often in, in Sanctuary type signatures, but any really is any JavaScript value. Um, so the idea is that we're going to attempt to parse the JSON. Uh, if the parsing fails, we're going to catch that exception. This is all in the implementation of parse JSON, so it's not something we have to worry about. But parse JSON will uh, it will parse that JSON inside a try block. Uh, if an exception is thrown, uh, it's going to catch that exception to stop our program from crashing, and it's going to return nothing. If uh, if the parsing succeeds, it's going to take that value, and we have no idea of the type of that value. Uh, it could be any JavaScript value, just about anything that could be serialized to JSON. And we're going to give that function to our predicate, and our predicate is going to decide whether or not we consider that to be valid. This turns out to be really powerful, because the problem with parsing JSON uh, is that, okay, parsing may succeed, but we really don't have any idea what we're dealing with. So if we were just to write vanilla JavaScript, we would end up dealing with this thing that we might call X. We, we don't know what it is. And then let's say that we, we, we hope there's an ID property on X. Um, but X could be null. Null is actually um, a value, a valid value that we might get back from json.parse. Um, so we can't even assume that it's an object. Uh, so we're going to have to write all this defensive code where we basically, uh, you know, check to see that x is not null, and then if x is not null, um, you know, access the ID property, and then maybe do a check to say, well, is that a number? Um, so we end up writing a lot of defensive code. What we can do with parse JSON is we can, you know, we can decide what's what's uh, going to be valid uh, in our use case. So the first thing we might do is provide a function that always returns true. Now, s.k, it's a bit unnecessary here. This is a function that takes an a and a b and returns the a. Uh, so it's a constant function. It, it always returns its first argument. So if we say s.k of true and foo, we're going to get back true. It doesn't matter uh, what the second uh, value is. We're going to get back true. Now, another way of writing that in JavaScript would be this. Uh, instead of s.k of true, we could write an arrow function that just ignores its argument and returns true. Uh, but for whatever reason, I've, I've chosen to use uh, s.k here, so let's do that. So let's use parse JSON, and we'll give it this predicate that's always going to return true, and then let's give it our broken uh, JSON string, and we're going to get back nothing. Okay, that's good. So we didn't have to deal with exceptions, uh, the function is going to return us a value that indicates whether or not uh, the parsing succeeded. But we'll uh, show in a minute how parseJSON can be used in some really powerful ways. Before we do that, we have to go on a brief tangent. Now, uh, if we don't have uh, sanctuary def imported, we want to require sanctuary def now. That's what that dollar sign is. So $.integer is a type value. So JavaScript doesn't have types, but what we can do is we can have values that uh, represent types. And so in this case, $.integer is uh, 
more or less a predicate that's going to tell us whether or not a value is an integer. And that combines nicely with this function called is. Is takes a type value, such as $.integer, and any JavaScript value, and tells us whether or not that value is a member of that type. So we can ask, is 12.34 an integer? And the answer is no. If we ask about 1,234, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, but this gets even more powerful when we combine it with a function such as $.array. So $.array, instead of being a type value, it's a function from type to type. So it lets us describe various array types. So in this case, we can say is the array that contains 1.5 an array of integers. And the answer, of course, is no. So let's just prove to ourselves that that works. So that is false. But if we change this to 1, 2, 3, that is an array of integers. That's really sweet. Um, and if you've used a Haskell library uh, called ASON, um, this will actually start to look really familiar um, because we get to do this. We get to say we want to parse this string, which might or might not be valid JSON. I want, I want this function to handle the failure case for me if it's, if it's not valid JSON. If it succeeds, I want this function to give me whatever it is that it produces by parsing that. In this case, it would be an array containing one, two, and three. And then I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell the parseJSON function whether I consider that to be valid. So what's wonderful about this is that this is going to give us back a value of type maybe array of integers. And we then know for the rest of the, you know, the, the scope, the rest of the, um, of, the, of the time that we're dealing with this value in our program, we're going to know exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, so we get to avoid all of that defensive programming that I mentioned earlier. So let's just uh, try this just to see whether we get a maybe as we expect. So let's try it with some invalid JSON. We get back nothing. Let's try it with 1, 2, 3.14. That's also nothing. If we change it to 1, 2, 3, 4, we get back just an array 1, 2, 3, 4. So this allows us to deal with the uncertainty in one place, uh, right at the sort of the edge of the, of the program. So it might be the code that's dealing with the, uh, the requests coming into the API, for example. And the rest of our code can deal with these values that, uh, that we can reason about. So lookups are another thing that could fail. So I won't bother to, to run these in the REPL, but uh, this is a common source of uh, type errors in JavaScript. Uh, we assume that this foobar baz path is going to exist, and the lookup fails at some point, and we either get back undefined, or uh, you know, we get undefined when we look for foo, and then we try to look for bar and undefined, and it blows up. So earlier we looked at a function called prop, and get as I mentioned, is the cousin of prop. So get is one of these functions that I mentioned that takes this very general predicate as its first argument. And so this allows us to do something very similar to what parseJSON was allowing, which is we can take some value that we're given that we hope is maybe an object that has a particular, uh, a particular property, um, but we're going to except the fact that the property might not exist in this case. So uh, to give an example, uh, we might say, well, uh, this could have a property named visible. Um, we want it to be a Boolean value if it's there. Um, but if it's not there, just give me back nothing. So this is either going to give us back nothing, just false, or just true. Those are the only three possible values that we could get from, uh, from this code. And in this case, of course, the property is there, uh, so we'll get back just false. So 
Chain is great for sequential operations, these things like take the head of the head or whatever. Um, but sometimes we want to perform operations in parallel. And chain by its nature does things one at a time and it uses the result of the previous computation uh, to determine the input to, to the following computation. Um, funnily enough, <laughs> right after saying that chain does things sequentially, I'm going to introduce you a function called sequence, uh, which sort of does the opposite, which is um, let you take results that you may have produced in parallel somehow and um, combine them in some quite powerful ways. So um, if any of you have done any JavaScript programming in the last few years, you've probably used promises. Uh, and yeah, my condolences, uh, I have too. Um, and you're probably familiar with a function called uh, promise.all. And what that's doing is it's saying, hey, I've got this uh, array of promises and I want to uh, get back a single promise for an array of the results. It's, it's a common thing to want to do because we don't want to deal with these, uh, these results one at a time. We might be making Ajax requests to various services and we want to do something once we have all the results and we have all the context we need. So it turns out that promise.all is, is another miss for JavaScript. Um, it's another case of doing something for a specific data type uh, that could have been done in a more general way. And had it been done in the more general way, there wouldn't be thousands of Stack Overflow questions about, you know, why is this promise swallowing my exception? Or, you know, how do I return a promise inside a promise? Or, you know, there are, there are just various special cases. The promise spec is, I don't know how long, like 40 pages or something. Um, and I could show you the source code for sequence and it would be like two lines of code. Um, so yeah, it's sad, um, but we have a spec called Fantasyland. It's all about rainbows and unicorns and things. And um, actually it was created by uh, Brian McKenna, who is I think a frequent LambdaConf attendee. I don't think he's here this year, um, but uh, he created it in response to a heated discussion on GitHub uh, on the Promises A plus spec repo. Uh, someone had suggested, why don't we use category theory and we would have like these really nice consistent interfaces and we could just use, you know, we could just use map. We could just have this map idea and we could have this flat map idea. And uh, that was shot down by all the, um, the sort of uh, JavaScript people with tens of thousands of followers and lots of popular repos and things. Uh, and uh, one of them uh, memorably said, uh, I think you should go back to your uh, typed programming fantasy land. And so Brian McKenna uh, later that day uh, responded uh, on the thread to say, uh, I've created a new spec called fantasy land. Um, and that was in about 2000 and maybe 2012 or, or so. And since then uh, it's grown a lot and there are some quite a number of libraries that are built upon it. And essentially what it allows us to do is to uh, use object-oriented programming to uh, make our various uh, custom types compatible with these general functions. So you could define your own type and you could say, oh, I want to use s.map on my type. So you would implement a special method called fantasyland slash map. And if you wanted to be fancy, you could uh, write a test suite and you could actually, um, you could use a package called fantasy laws um, along with some uh, property based testing. So you could generate some uh, JavaScript values, thousands of JavaScript values that should be valid inputs to, uh, to uh, your map operation. And you can then use fantasy laws. It's going to run uh, all of these inputs and it's going to check that the laws are, um, are observed by your type, um, which is really nice because it means that as a community, we can build these libraries um, that all interoperate in really nice ways. So for example, where we had promise.all before, we could have person A create, you know, some type called, you know, foo and another person create a type called bar 
and they could both implement the right methods and then we could say, ah, oh, I've got a foo of bars and I want to get a bar of foos. And you could just use sequence and it would just work, assuming that they were both uh, capable of supporting uh, the, the type class that Fantasyland defines for sequence. So it's really cool. Um, so let's have a look at sequence. Um, so my, my girlfriend is also a programmer and uh, she has attended LambdaConf in the past and she's really interested in functional programming um, and she tells me off for having uh, bad documentation. Uh, and I've said to her, I would love a pull request, um, but it's really, really hard to describe uh, what sequence does. Um, so what I said is it takes a T of F of A and returns an F of T of A. And it's really hard to say anything more than that because we don't know what T is, we don't know what F is, and we don't know what A is. And that's sort of the beauty. So it really just sort of turns something inside out. So um, let's look at a particular example. So here we have an array of maybes and we want a maybe of an array. And so we use sequence and we turn it inside out. And we can do the opposite operation, which is we have a maybe of uh, an array and we want an array of maybe. So we can go backwards and forwards in some cases. This is really cool. And what's even cooler is that there's a uh, library called uh, Flucha, which uh, is a fantasy land compatible alternative to promises. Um, and it's, uh, it's really nice. It would allow us to have an array of futures, say the results of three different uh, Ajax requests, and we could say we want to do the promise.all type thing, and we could sequence, and we could turn it into a future for an array of the results. It's really nice. Um, so that's sequence, and if you can come up with a, a better description than turning something inside out, please tell me. Um, so far, yeah, so far I haven't seen anything. So yeah, this is just what we were looking at on the website. So we can take this array, just one, just two, just three. We can get back just an array, one, two, three. And this is really nice. And for the final challenge, this is going to be uh, quite important. So uh, the way that I think about this is that um, one uh, failure sort of corrupts the whole, uh, the whole operation. So if we have, let's just go back to having just one, just two, just three. I forgot my prefixes. Oops. So if we go back to this, uh, we turn it inside out. That's great. Just one, just two, just, uh, sorry, just one, two, three. And now if we put a failure value in there, what do you think is going to happen? Keep in mind that the return type has to be a maybe containing an array of numbers in this case. And yeah, so there are a few different things that it could do potentially, but the way the behavior has been defined for, um, for the maybe type uh, is that it has this sort of tainting quality. So one nothing is going to, is going to taint the whole, uh, the whole collection. Um, and in case you're wondering about this funny argument, uh, this is something that wouldn't be necessary in a language like Haskell because the, uh, the types could be inferred. Um, the problem is that if we had a situation like this, um, this is a valid operation, but without this s.maybe hint, um, sequence wouldn't know what it's meant to do because um, it, it needs to know, well, okay, you're asking me to take this array that doesn't contain anything and put it inside something. What do you want me to put it inside? So that's what that first argument is. As I mentioned, it wouldn't be required in Haskell, but this is one of only a few places where the code is, you know, different in a meaningful way from, from the equivalent Haskell code. Sorry, just to clarify, the second argument, the maybe, that is, you need that to iterate through the inner <coughs> array. Oh, so yeah, so what, what normally happens is we're, we're able to rely on the values that are inside the array to sort of dictate the container type. So in this case, 
uh, we have an array of maybes and we sort of take the first maybe out and we start, um, we start sort of smushing all those maybes together to create an, uh, a maybe that has all, all the results inside. Um, but in this case, there's actually not a single maybe in sight. So, so sequence needs to know, well, what do you want me to wrap this array in? Um, so it's a bit of boilerplate. Um, it's unfortunate because it does sort of force us to hard code something that could otherwise be uh, left more general. But in practice, it's not a big deal. Uh, we could. So let's, uh, let's do something different. So let's say, let's put um, array here. So now we get an array inside an array. So that's just telling us what do you want me to wrap this in? Um, there are even some other things we might be able to wrap it in. Uh, there's an ether type in Sanctuary. So we could wrap it inside the ether type. Um, So this is really the culmination of all the, uh, all the functions that we've looked at and the ideas that we've, uh, that we've been uh, thinking about. And it's admittedly a contrived example, um, but I think a contrived example can be quite useful because it can allow us to, uh, in a very sort of small piece of code, uh, deal with a lot of these uh, these ideas multiple times. So this is our, our challenge. We have a, um, a string, which could be a valid JSON string. And we're hoping that if it's a valid JSON string, it looks something like this. It's going to be an object with an X property, whose value is an object with a Y property, whose value is an object with a Z property, whose value we hope is an array of strings which we hope are hex strings. So base 16 uh, you know, integers represented as strings. Uh, and we want to say if all the elements of x, y, z are hex strings, we want to return the sum. So as I say, completely contrived, uh, but it does make it easy to fit on a slide. And uh, we get to use a lot of the uh, functions that we've worked with so far, and uh, a lot of the sort of uh, chaining of operations which may fail. So um, I suggest if you're interested that you, you, uh, you work on this on your own computer. What I'm going to do though is go back to uh, the basics and I'm going to put a little test case in here. And we'll start by testing the happy path. That's the one that's really easy in JavaScript, uh, in sort of vanilla JavaScript to get right. So we want 28, 29, and 20a. Um, and at the moment, all we're going to do is, um, you know, basically echo what we, what we started with. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is show the naive JavaScript solution. So we want to parse the input. We want to look up the x, look up the y, look up the z. And then we want to reduce that array. And we're going to um, use the parseInt function. And we're going to add all the values together, starting with 0. So what are some of the problems uh, with this code? Because <laughs> there are a few in just a small piece of code. So this is the first problem. Uh, so the parsing could fail. This is the second problem. We have no idea whether the thing that we get back from uh, json.parse is something that is even safe to do property access on. Just to show you what I mean, uh, because it is quite surprising. If I parse the string null, I get null. That's actually a valid uh, JSON value, so I can, you know, I can turn it into something. So if I try to do uh, you know, find me the X property of the result of parsing the string. Even if the parsing succeeds, I might uh, have an exception uh, at that point. So, okay, so the dot X is a problem. So is the dot Y. So is the dot Z. So is the dot reduce, because who knows what X, Y, Z is? It might not be an array. Or it might be something that is not an array that still happens to have 
uh, something called reduce attached to it. Uh, so this is another assumption. We're assuming that if XYZ does exist and is an array, that it's an array of strings. Uh, and I really don't want to go into what might happen with parsint if we give it non-string values. Um, probably it's going to do some type coercion and maybe it will end up working uh, for the wrong reason. And finally, this is an assumption uh, because we're not checking to see whether the string is a valid hex string. And the requirements of this contrived challenge are that if one of the, uh, if one or more of the values is not a valid hex string, uh, we want to have the operation as a whole fail. So this is uh, what I've done sort of to provide um, sort of a framework uh, for us to start with rather than just throwing you into the deep end and saying, go off and read the documentation for all these things. Let's just write the, um, the JavaScript code uh, that we had before, but in a pipe form. This will allow us to sort of uh, update this code. We can sort of replace each unsafe operation with a safe one, potentially. So we want to parse. We want to get the x, get the y, get the z. And then we want to parse each of those strings. Again, we're not removing any of the assumptions here. We're just uh, reshaping the code. And finally, we're going to take the sum. Excuse me. And we get 123. So, OK, um, everything worked, which is, which is nice. But there are at least half a dozen things that we could do uh, to you know, find errors in this code simply by choosing a different input string. So the first thing we're going to want to do, what I might do is just uh, comment this out. And let's start with this first function, this parseJSON. So we don't want to use json.parse because, well, it can throw exceptions. So what are we going to use instead? Exactly, s.parseJson. And let me um, jump ahead one slide. So the uh, Sanctuary documentation lives at sanctuary.js.org. And as I mentioned, uh, if we want to say find the docs for parseJson, uh, we can just change this fragment uh, and we'll jump straight to it. Uh, the other thing we could do, of course, is uh, use the table of contents, but it might not be obvious where to look. In this case, well, it's probably in the parse section. So, okay, parse JSON. So we need to give it this general predicate. And what I like to do is initially just get the thing working. So let's use the, the always true predicate. And so now we can, um, we can test this. And of course, we've commented out all the other operations. We'll get to them in due course. But uh, we can at least see now whether we're able to, uh, to parse a JSON string. And you can see that we have just down here. The reason we get this nice string representation is because we're using uh, s.show. And that's going to... Um, call a special uh, show method on the maybe to, to give us this representation. Okay, so let's move on. So we've, we've passed this JSON string. We can, if we want to, we can prove to ourselves that uh, we've done something that's half valid by just truncating this string, running this again, and we get nothing. Okay, so we're handling, we're handling invalid JSON. So that is uh, pretty much something we get without much effort on our part uh, because parseJSON is doing the hard work for us. But how are we going to safely get the X property from this value? Because if we were to put a type, uh, a type on F, F is a function that takes a string. We know it takes a string because the first function in our pipeline is expecting a string. And we know it's going to return a maybe of some type but 
what goes in the place of these question marks? Any guesses? Well, in our case, we were getting this X, Y, Z array of uh, strings or whatever, but it could also be null. It could be a number. It could be, uh, well, if, if JSON were more thoughtfully created, maybe it would give us a date, but I don't think that's even possible. Um, but it could really be any JavaScript value. So that's the problem with our current situation. We've safely parsed the JSON, but we're still dealing with uncertainty. Uh, we don't know what this value looks like. Um, but if we look at the, uh, the documentation for this get function that we looked at earlier, so get allows us to safely uh, get a, a value from an object by its uh, property name. So here we're asking for the X property of this object. And we're saying, well, we're only interested in the value if X is a number. So this is, this is great. Um, there's an X, uh, X is one, one is a number. So we get back just one. Here we have something that um, to a JavaScript programmer might look like a number. Uh, but no, the string one is not equal to the number one. Uh, and the string one is not a member of dollar dot number. So we get back nothing. And in the third case, uh, there's no X at all. So we get back nothing. So again, what's nice is that we have two different failure cases. We have this uh, X exists, but is not uh, satisfactory uh, according to our predicate. And we have this other case where uh, x is not present. So the maybe type is really nice for collapsing these uh, different failure cases. Now, of course, there are times when you actually care about the reason that something failed. And in that case, you would want to use the either type instead, or perhaps a validation type or something else. Um, but for our purposes, this uh, this collapsing behavior is very nice because we're going to end up with nothing for any number of different reasons. Um, but that's not a problem. We're not interested in knowing which particular operation failed. We just want the eventual successful result or nothing in the case of failure. Okay, so we're going to need to do something uh, to get the X. So how do we perform an operation inside a maybe? What's the first thing we think of? How do we perform an operation inside an array? We can map. We can map over an array. And one way to think about the maybe type is it's like an array that is either empty or contains one element. So we know that it's safe to map over an empty array. We know that it's safe to map over a singleton array. And it's just the same with um, with maybe. So here we're going to map. And remember, this argument, we don't know, um, we don't know what type it is. It could be any type because we have currently maybe any. So we have to do something with any. And there are not many functions um, that we can, we can apply to any because we couldn't apply something like math.square root. Well, of course, we need a number for that. And th this may be a number, but we, we can't be sure of that. But what we can do is we can say, well, we want to use the get function. Again, we need to give it a predicate as its first argument. For now, let's just give it the always true predicate. We might come back to this a bit later. The second argument is simply the property name. And the third argument is the, uh, the thing the thing that we're trying to access the x of. And this is actually unnecessary function wrapping. We can remove this lambda. And so now we have something here, which is kind of roughly equivalent to this. Um, but what do you think this is going to give us uh, if we run this? So keep in mind, we have, we have this x, y, z thing. We're looking up the x. So we're hoping we're going to get back this, this, uh, you know, this sub object. 
and let's see what happens. Okay, so we did get back the, the sub-object, but we got some nesting that we didn't want. We're now inside an extra maybe. So can anyone remember what we can do? And this is what I love about this style of programming. There are only like six functions, and all we do is just keep using those same functions. Uh, so someone uh, in the Ramda and Sanctuary community, James Forbes, uh, wrote this, uh, I think it was James, wrote this blog post, uh, and the title was something like, uh, the only API you'll ever need to learn, or something to that effect. Um, and that, that really is what's so wonderful about these abstractions, is that we learn map, we learn chain, we learn join, and a few other things, and then we can work with anything assuming that the world cooperates and we have this nice ecosystem of uh, algebraic data types that uh, support fantasy land. And that's what's so frustrating. Uh, once one gets into this mindset of really general uh, functions that are just so uh, useful in so many different contexts, we stop wanting to ever read documentation. I hate learning a new project and having to go to its readme and having to learn some bespoke functions that the author has provided for me, which are usually, you know, a non-lawful version of Traverse and, you know, maybe a map that isn't lawful for various reasons and a smattering of other functions. Um, I just want to take someone else's data type and just use all the sanctuary functions uh, because that, for the most part, should be all I need. Now, of course, if there's something specific to your data type, well, of course, by all means, provide some functions um, that, that work for that. But don't, uh, don't give me just bad versions of uh, things that um, you know, smart people like Brian McKenna have already um, specified. We should just follow, follow the lead of, of those people. So the um, answer, to come back to this, is join. Anytime we have a nested structure and we want to get rid of some nesting, we use join. So that's great. Um, what's better than using map then join? Not introducing the nesting in the first place. So I'll skip ahead. I'll, I'll catch up uh, with the slides on the left now. So we started with our empty pipeline. We passed the JSON. And this is um, really the direction that we're heading in. Um, so we can replace the combination of map and join with chain. If we use chain instead of map, we don't need join because chain essentially does the joining as it goes. Um, so we can run this in the REPL. We should get exactly the same result, and we do. Um, now to do the Y and the Z, uh, we copy and paste. We just imagine that we're programming in Go. 